And before I move on to a new topic with you, Mr Gotowski, I want to go back to a couple of points that we addressed this morning to pick up some things that I've been asked by core participants to raise with you. Um, if we could go, first of all, go back to WITN 5292101, please. It's the page two, please. It's the memo that dealt with um, the anonymisation, uh, the redaction of names of patients and doctors. Um, and there's two points I've been asked to flag up from that paragraph three, one of which we, we did address this morning, but I'll pick it up again. Uh, just at the end of, uh, towards the middle of paragraph three, it, it does indicate here that you had agreed with Sol, C5, and Treasury Solicitor uh, that you would continue to remove the doctors' names and leave it to the plaintiffs to challenge. So just to flag that point, I think we did see that this morning. And then if we read on in the paragraph, I've been asked to flag that in your memo you said, if they do decide to challenge us at the uh, next hearing set for the 26th of June, we may need to defend our position with affidavit evidence and possibly a minister's certificate. That <coughs> reference to affidavit evidence and possibly a minister's <coughs> certificate was a reference to a public interest immunity application, wasn't it? Uh, I believe it was, yes. And that at this stage, no such application had yet been made. No. But that in the course of time it was made and the redaction of the doctors' names was not challenged by the plaintiffs in subsequent PII uh, discussions. That's right. Uh, and it's right uh, that the underlying concern about naming the doctors was one of um, a concern about jeopardising the effectiveness of the reporting system, so public it was, safety. It was a long-standing um, view of... <coughs> Um, the licensing authority that the whole basis upon the yellow, yellow car scheme being so successful was the fact that patients and doctors were anonymized. There was a worry that if doctors' names appeared, um, then doctors would stop sending in yellow card um, information. And <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and you said in your evidence that you uh, thought that you had been asked by the Secretary of State that Wales and Northern Ireland shouldn't be included in the discussions. Uh, could we turn up DHSC 0016743? And we see here under the heading devolution... Secretary of State has asked that Wales and Northern Ireland are not included in discussions of the payment scheme at this stage. Uh, sorry, I should have said this is a meeting in July 2003 uh, with you and also two people from the solicitor's office, uh, Mary Trefgarn and Joanna Nicholson. Uh, and we see under the heading devolution, SOS, uh, SOS has asked that Wales and Northern Ireland are not included in discussions of the payment scheme at this stage. However, DH may be under certain obligations to share information if the scheme is determined not to be a devolved issue, which is thought most likely. In addition, no matter what the outcome of the devolution decision, DH runs the risk of antagonising the administrations if it presents them with a fait accompli scheme discussions on the progress made by the Scottish executive would also be required. Sol agreed to confirm that this is not a devolution issue, clarify if DH is legally or honour bound to share information with the two administrations and assess the possible impact should the issue be deemed to be a devolved uh, issue, I think it should say, and Wales and or Northern Ireland refuse to join a scheme, uh, complaints of discrimination, etc. Then you agreed over the page to ask ministers for a steer as to when to involve the Wales and Northern Ireland administrations. Is this the document you were thinking of this morning? It was, yes. I, I knew I'd seen something. Indeed. And then you also <coughs> referred to a letter um, from, uh, from uh, Paul Botet yeah. um, <clears throat> in relation to the Treasury position. Could we turn to DHSC 0014997? underscore double one six. Uh, this is a letter from uh, Paul Boateng to uh, John Reid and we can see at paragraph three the conditions that were applied by the Treasury in relation to the scheme. Uh, 
that the DH agree to meet the full costs of the scheme from your current settlement and that you agree not to make a claim on the reserve to meet these costs or seeking additional funds to cover them in the forthcoming spending review. That there's discussion with Wales and Northern Ireland uh, and over the page that you further agree and secure a similar agreement with the devolved administrations that the Department of Health and devolved administrations will meet in full any future costs incurred should there be a legal obligation put in place, comparable payment arrangements arising from any compensation awarded as a direct result of the precedent set by the establishment of this scheme. Uh, again, is this the document you were thinking of this morning? It, the it, it was, and I think the, the, the two key things also is this, the first Sent the first sentence on paragraph four in handling this announcement is vital to minimise the risk of setting a dangerous precedent in other areas. And then you link that, if you go back to the first page, please, sorry. Um, paragraph two, I have real reservations about this course of action. So I think if you put it all together as a package with his conditions, then there are strong concerns coming out of Treasury about going down a particular road of a setting up a scheme. And given, as I mentioned this morning, the current spending constraints that are across the whole of Whitehall at this particular time, it, was, it needs, all looked, needs to be looked at in the context of the overall picture. You said this morning um, that the department were very clear that they needed to identify all those who were potential beneficiaries, including those who were infected by blood transfusion. What steps did the, the department take or ask uh, the Skipton Fund to take to identify those uh, potential beneficiaries? I, th I, I was thinking about this over lunch, and I think what we may have done, but I, I can't swear to this, I, is that <clears throat> there's a look back, something called a look back exercise. Um, the details of which I'm not 100% clear, but I believe that was part of the um, way of trying to identify um, potential recipients by going on the basis of this look back exercise. That's the only thing I could think of over lunch that um, that, that, that might have been done. Um, two, two other short points in relation to, skip, to the yep. Skipton Fund. Um, in the McFarland <coughs> Trust, <coughs> user trustees were appointed. So um, some of the trustees were those who were also beneficiaries. Yep. Now, the inquiry is very familiar with the fact that the Skipton Fund was not a trust, so it didn't operate in the same way. Was there any consideration... That was on the basis of legal advice. It couldn't be a trust because of its charitable status. So because of the charitable um, status of, of McFarland. It's a slightly different point that I'm asked to Sorry, raise with you. No, I no, a slightly different point I'm asked to raise, and that is, was there any consideration given to how beneficiaries might be involved in the running of the Skipton Fund? Um... We may have done, but I can't remember. And, and finally, on the Skipton Fund, um, when the department decided to exclude dependents from eligibility, what, if any, consideration was given to spouses or partners who'd had to give up their own income uh, and careers to provide care and psychological reassurance to those infected? I can't remember if that was part of the discussions. It, it may well have been, but I, I honestly cannot remember. And in relation to the dependence question particularly, uh, do you accept that the, it became a cost-driven approach, which was no longer being driven by the right thing to do? Um, I, I accept that it was a cost-driven approach. I want to move on to a completely different topic uh, now, um, and that is uh, relating to the Bergen report. Uh, this was the internal report that was commissioned before you started in your role as head of blood policy. Yes. 
uh, dealing with the question of self-sufficiency. Yeah. It's right, isn't it, that the terms of reference were prepared before you took on your role? Yes. Then can we, Paul, can we turn up DHSC 5541395, please? This is an email from Charles Lister to Zabida Sedat with UCC'd. It's dated the 10th of June 2003. So very early doors uh, in relation to your, um, your being in post. We can see um, that uh, this is a response from Charles Lister, in relation to a PQ, a parliamentary question, I think this was what you were referring I've, to. I referred to that earlier on this morning, yeah. Where yeah. Charles Lister had got involved in an answer to a PQ because you were so freshly in post. Yeah, absolutely. And so we see here his response to Ms Sedat. The remit for the work done by Peter Bergen was to review surviving documents from 1973 to 1985 to address a number of issues, chiefly... <coughs> how the department implemented the policy of UK self-sufficiency in blood products begun in 1973. Lord Owen has said publicly that officials did not carry out his wishes. To chart the developing understanding of the seriousness of non-A, non-B hepatitis, later identified as hepatitis C. To examine the extent to which problems at BPL delayed the achievement of self-sufficiency. Whether the achievement of self-sufficiency would have led to fewer cases of hepatitis C in haemophilia patients. <coughs> It was not set up to address Lord Owen's allegation, dating from the late 80s, that the papers from his period as a minister had been pulped. Then we go over. Unfortunately, none of the key submissions to ministers about self-sufficiency from the 70s, early 80s, appear to have survived. Our search of relevant surviving files from the time failed to find any. One explanation for this is that papers marked for public interest immunity during the discovery process on the <coughs> HIV litigation have since been destroyed in a clear out by Sol. There is an email from Anita James to me confirming this. This would have happened at some time in the mid-90s. I suspect that Lord Owen's allegation about pulped papers refers to the papers kept by private office, which are never kept after a change of government. They are either shredded or handed back to the relevant policy section. However, the fact that we can no longer find any of these documents, so you can't say what ministers did or didn't know about the state of play on self-sufficiency, just plays into the hands of the conspiracy theorists. Peter Bergen's report nonetheless contains some useful stuff. However, before we make it more widely available, it needs, I think, an executive summary, references added both to the documents quoted, e.g. quotes from published articles should be fully referenced, and to back up statements which otherwise remain unsubstantiated, e.g. Paris 5 of page 9 states, at this time, 1993, it was felt there were dangers in absolute self-sufficiency leading to a reliance on a sole supplier of blood products. It's no good putting this out unless we can say who felt this and in what context it was said. We should also be able to give ministers the option of releasing documents that corroborate statements made in the report. You may also wish to consider sending, with Minister's agreement, a final draft to some of the people consulted, e.g. Frank Hill, Terry, Terry Snape, Karen Pappenheim, for comments on factual accuracy. And then there's a possible response to the PQ. Is it fair, then, that as at June 2003, there was only minor work on referencing that was required on this report? Um, on the basis of this um, note from Charles, yes. And then if we turn to WITN 52920051, please. And if we go to page two, please. Uh, this is an email from you to Richard. Um, uh, sorry, uh, from from you to Graham Bickler. Um, you had been forwarded information from the press office about Scottish news headlines about the inquiry. 
uh, and this was you forwarding it on, uh, it says this, uh, it's dated the 19th of September 2003, and it says this, you should be aware of this, the driving force behind the call for a public inquiry is a document that purports to be a note of a meeting of haemophilia centre directors, at which the DOH was present, which took place in 1982. We have not seen a copy of this document, and it's not in our files. And then picking up in the next paragraph, our position is that it was 1985 when non-HEP A and B came to light, and we started to take measures. We have a strong line in that the virus was unknown, it could not be grown, and there was no test available. In addition, it has to be remembered that at the time there was no alternative, and not to have given haemophiliacs the blood would have led to early and painful death. But this document could cause some embarrassment, particularly as it now looks as if it will come into the public domain. Just pausing there, where did that information come from in that second paragraph that uh, it was uh, 1985 when non-A, non-B hepatitis came to light? I assume I got that from um, the policy files and, and um, I would have um, taken advice from... Um, uh, Hugh Nicholas as our medical um, advisor on this. <coughs> and then we get the final paragraph. This issue is at the moment concentrated in Scotland, but will clearly <coughs> cross the border, so we must get our lines straight. I will put in hand some defensive work once we have the document. I can see marches down Whitehall and protests outside Richmond House on the horizon. At this point, not having seen the document that was relied on, why do you say you'd put in place some defensive work? Because I said once we have the document. Why was there an assumption at this stage that that work would be defensive? Because the information that um, was coming out from Scotland was that this document could be an embarrassment. Therefore, if that proved to be the case, then we would need to do a defensive briefing. So but the defensiveness was about the embarrassment? The defensiveness was about what would be what was contained within the document, just in case it was embarrassing. Was any thought <coughs> given at this stage to the fact that the document might undermine what you understood the position to be and had set out in paragraph two? Um, could have been, yes. But without having seen the document, we didn't know. I think that's what I'm trying to explore with you, Mr Gotowski. Without knowing what was in the document, was there an assumption that it would be defensive? I think we need to put it into context of the um, fact that a lot of the um, information that was being, at the time, was being put into the public domain was highly critical of what various government departments had or hadn't done um, over the years. Um, and there was an assumption, therefore, made that um, whenever such documents were threatened, that we were threatened with such documents or such documents came to, to hand, that we would have to look at it on the basis of providing a defensive position on it, because otherwise they wouldn't be <coughs> going to the press, if you like, with a document that um, was supportive of the line that we were taking. So it was just a pragmatic civil service approach that you um, consider putting up defensive briefing in case it is needed. In some cases, it's not needed. In other cases, it, it will be needed. If we move on then to SCGB 40262 <coughs> underscore 116, please. We're moving on in time to October 2003. This is an email from Bob Stock uh, to which you'll CC'd uh, dealing with a draft reply to a question from Lord Morris. And Bob Stock said this, 
I don't have any problem with your draft. However, you'll see from the letter we sent to the Health Committee, which I'm sure I've already sent to David and or Richard, that the main reason we dismissed the Scotland on Sunday allegations was that they have to be viewed in the context of the general professional consensus at that time that non-A, non-B was a benign, non-progressive condition. You might want to take that on board, as Morris and co are likely to rubbish the arguments about the lack of a test and the fact that the virus hadn't been identified. I have sent the offending, offending document to Richard, and I realise you might not wish to concede in the reply that you've seen it. But the main issue is that it shows that the risk of non-A, non-B was known to be much greater in commercial products than in NHS products. The fact that the virus hadn't been identified then and there was no test aren't good arguments against that, since it would still have been possible, within the constraints of UK NHS capacity to produce Factor 8, to use proportionately more NHS product than was in fact used. The accusation that follows behind that is that we should have achieved self-sufficiency before we did. So the non-dangerous argument is central to refuting all this. Having seen this reply from Bob Stock, did that cause you to pause for thought about whether your earlier view was accurate? Uh, it would have done, yes. And do you recall taking any actions in light of that in um, relation to future lines to take? I hope that I would have done, but I, I cannot recall that I did. If we can move on then to DHSC 6259005, please. <coughs> Um, it's an email from you to Gerard, Gerard Hetherington, um, and it deals with a correspondence that Carol Grayson had um, written into the department with. We pick up the third paragraph. The call for a public inquiry into the accusation that the department knowingly allowed contaminated blood to be used is linked to the allegations of the shredding of Lord Owen's papers. We commissioned a review of the papers which show that Lord Owen's papers are missing. We believe they were shredded by solicitors during the HIV litigation. Uh, just pausing there in relation to Lord Owen's papers, um, the Bergen report hadn't addressed that question, had it? No. So was, what was your source of information that that's what had happened? It was an exchange of um, emails between uh, Charles Lister and... <coughs> Um, Anita James, James in uh, sole litigation. Uh, we carry on. Uh, <coughs> sorry, just before we move on from that, you didn't yourself do any further investigation into that question? I thought there was no need to. Um, you know, the exchange between Charles and Anita seemed to be so clear-cut that there didn't seem to be any need to revisit that issue. If we carry on reading, uh, we agreed that we would meet with Melanie Johnson to discuss how best to make the findings of the review public. She was fairly robust about coming clean last time I spoke to her. Again, just pausing there, what's the reference to coming clean uh, to? Um, to uh, publicising what was said. No, um, no, to actually saying that the documents were... Um, uh, destroyed inadvertently, if I can put it that way, by solicitors following the HIV litigation. Uh, and then we carry on. I'd like to bring someone in to finish off the report in the sense of producing a chronology, cross-referencing the documents referred to, and clearing it with those consulted during its production. In addition, we need to produce an executive summary which could be published. <coughs> it would also be useful if at the same time someone, i.e. Hugh Nicholas, could produce a subsidiary report on the issue of when non-A, non-B and hepatitis C was first identified and what decisions were taken at the time and for what reasons. This would give us an extra degree of confidence in our line that we dealt with hepatitis C as soon as we became aware of it. So in terms of the practicalities of the report, uh, this is uh, March 2004. Yeah. Is it right that nothing had happened about this cross-referencing, finalising the details since June 2003? Absolutely. 
and you said in your statement the reason for that was staffing pressures and the huge amount of work that your team were involved in. Absolutely. It was, um, you know, we, we, we were, all of us were working exceptionally long hours trying to push other things through. And this um, was one of those um, jobs that ended up behind everything else. Uh, and I want to pick up this last suggestion in your email that there needs to be a subsidiary report on the issue of hepatitis C. Why did you think that a subsidiary report was required? I think because of the concerns that have been um, uh, raised before about the non, when it was known um, about non A, non B, and hepatitis C when they were first identified, and if we were going to, somebody was going to do the work that we wanted them to do on the Bergen report at the same time, you could keep, almost, if you like, kill two birds with one stone and look at these other issues as well. I was very conscious of the fact, again, on a resources point of view, that I didn't want work to begin on looking at the, um, getting everything tight, all the loose ends tied up on the Bergen report, and then afterwards having to commission somebody else to look at the non-A, non-B bit, because I wanted Hugh Nicholas to do it. I thought he could do the whole lot at the same time, but unfortunately he was... Um, um, tied up with, I think it was, is it a hep C strategy or something? Something like that rings a bell in my mind. Um, he was involved in other things. The suggestion that there needed to be a subsidiary report might suggest that you were uneasy about the findings in the Bergen report about hepatitis C. Was that something, was that how you felt? Or, or, was or it, it might be that I wanted to, I wanted the extra confidence of having it looked at in detail again by by somebody else but not that i didn't have confidence in what was produced before but you wanted the extra confidence of another medic having i wanted the extra confidence given the um importance of, of, of the issue yes it, almost like a, a second comfort blanket um and when you suggested that in the email you were anticipating it being someone like hugh nicholas who was a, a medic and, if I and who has been steeped involved. In the, steeped in the issues. Who has been steeped in the issues, exactly. Could we then turn to DHSC 533-6358? It's an email from you to Gerard Hetherington uh, again, and there's lots of details about your, your team. But if we turn over the page to the end of the email... Uh, we have this final paragraph. When we last met Melanie Johnson, she gave us three months to sort out the problem of accusations of self-sufficiency of blood and the shredding of Lord Owen's papers. We have a report produced, the Bergen Report, but it's not in form to be published or conclusions drawn from it. We agreed I should pursue appointing a medical writer to redraft the report in a more robust form. I am meeting Adam Jacobs from a medical consultancy next <coughs> Friday to see whether they're able to take on the work. Um, just pausing there, what did you mean when you said it needed to be redrafted in a more robust form? Um, I, I, what, what I meant there was to redraft or, um, or pull, rather than redraft it, actually pull together into, into a stronger form for it to be published. Because um, when we first got the, uh, the Bergen report, it, it wasn't in a format that was um, uh, okay to, to put out into the public domain. It needed to be pulled together. I, I, I didn't use the word robust there um, in the sense of trying to um, strengthen up any of the conclusions that were, or to undermine any of the conclusions that were reached. And just in terms of the, the redraft, that might have suggested that you were seeking substantial changes to the report rather than finalising it or, or something like that. No, I, th I think a, 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 a better use, a better word would have been to finalise the report rather than redraft. Now, that was bad drafting on my point, on my part, back then. 
And then if we carry on in the paragraph, ideally I would have liked you, Nicholas, to get involved in assessing whether the decisions made at the time stand up in the light of the knowledge at the time and the information available. Unfortunately, he's tied up with work on the Hep C strategy and the Hep C payment scheme application form. If the consultancy firm feel they are able to do the work, the same question then applies, have we the money? Um, why did you think, why were you considering using the medical writing firm um, to assess whether the decisions may, made stood up? Because I, 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 if I rec recollect, I was, I was advised that this particular company had the expertise of doing this type of work. It, it might seem somewhat unusual for a writing consultancy, a medical writing consultancy, to also address matters of substance. Do you have any recollection of, of your thinking or the um, discussions you had about that? Um, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, my, my main concern at this point is just to get somebody in to do the work. <coughs> given the um, very strong steer we've been given from Melanie Johnson. Um, could we then move on to um, September uh, 2004? It's DHSC 6258608, please. the bottom of the page, an email from you uh, to Gerard Hetherington and uh, Ailsa White. Uh, please see the attached note from Scotland concerning an article in the Sunday Herald on self-sufficiency and a public inquiry, and in particular the quote from Lord Morris that he will revisit the issue with ministers. There is nothing new here, but the timing could be fortuitous in that we have just received the report we commissioned on this whole issue, and we could attempt to finally nail this long-running saga. The uh, Herald article also generated some interest from the Guardian, which they didn't pursue. Uh, this will also open up the pulping of Lord Owen's papers, but we can just admit that they are missing. We believe destroyed by mistake by the lawyers following the HIV litigation. No one will believe this, but it is the truth. And then a little further down, in preparation for the inevitable questions, we need to be prepared. The new report we commissioned concludes that the government did pursue the goal of self-sufficiency in Factor 8 during the 1970s and most of the 1980s, in line with WHO and EC recommendations, and this is documented publicly. Therefore, despite the loss of Lord Owen's papers, his policy was not neglected. On the question of use of contaminated blood, the report concludes that it is reasonable to suppose that the government would have known of the <coughs> risks of contracting. Uh, contracting hepatitis from blood products, but that the virus in question, non-A, non-B hepatitis, was perceived as mild and often asymptomatic disease, and the advantages of, of treatment with factor VIII concentrates far outweighed its potential risks. This view was supported by patients, their physicians, and the Haemophilia Society. As always, a balance needed to be drawn to weigh <coughs> the improvements in quality of life and the dangers of bleeding against the risks of treatment. The report also states that doctors did in fact explain these risks to patients, which again counters claims that they were not told. Uh, and then we go further down. All this, I believe, gives us a strong base to pursue our consistent line that a public inquiry is not warranted. The key is how we take this forward. In coming to the view that you express in this email, were you relying entirely on the Bergen report? Yes. <clears throat> with the benefit of hindsight, do you think this is actually a matter that ought properly to have been considered within a public inquiry, rather than within an internal uh, report? Um, on the basis of what I had um, determined from the Bergen report, um, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't persuaded that um, a public inquiry would um, find um, at the time anything um, extra to um, lead to a change of um, 
lead to a change of position. So I was um, um, persuaded at the time, as I've said here, and on in numerous other documents which have been presented to me, um, that I didn't think a public inquiry was warranted at the time. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. I don't know what has transpired since my time in the blood team or what extra evidence has come to light since my time in the blood team which has um, led to this public inquiry. But at the time, and based on the information I had, um, I think the comments I made at the time were defensible on the basis of the information I had in front of me. Sorry, if I can just have a moment, sir. <coughs> yes. Could we turn then to um, DHSC 5041563, please? Um, it's an email uh, from you, I think, to Ailsa White. Um, thanks for passing this on. Carol, it's a, uh, she was forwarding on a copy of a, a letter from Carol Grayson. Um, thanks for passing this on. Carol Grayson is well known to us an as an independent campaigner against the Hep C payment scheme and the need for an independent inquiry on self-sufficiency. And it goes on to uh, set out the... A significant number of emails and letters that she had sent to the department. And then if we pick up at the bottom of the page, on the question of an inquiry, our line is that we have no evidence to show that there was any wrongdoing at the time and that an inquiry was not justified. Uh, we recently commissioned further work following agreement by Melanie Johnson into the allegations being made. The report, which is currently being peer-reviewed, has concluded that the government at the time acted reasonably. We will therefore be putting a submission to ministers in the near future on how the conclusions of the review can be made public. Can you help us uh, in relation to what you meant by it being peer-reviewed? That's that consultancy firm that I <coughs> commissioned. So there wasn't a further process of any of, of Hugh Nicholas or, or any external medics apart from the medical writing consultancy looking at it? No. To, to whom were they peers? Uh, peer, peer review would suggest that somebody of equal status to whoever is, um, is whose views are being considered uh, is looking at it. Who were the medical consultancy writing team? Uh, who were they peers of? Um, Peter Berg, the author of the report. Yes, I see. Thank you. <coughs> And we see um, in this email that effectively you're maintaining uh, the line to take that has been used fairly consistently over the years, that there was no need for a public inquiry. Is that yes. right? Yes. I think the important point to note is that at no point in any of the correspondence and communication did senior officers or ministers challenge the position that I was putting up. It might be suggested that there was a line to take. There had been a line to take for a number of years, and that line was being stuck to by the department. It, it could be suggested irrespective of uh, the information available to you. What would your response be to that? I would say that we would stick into the line to take because that was the position on the basis of the information we had. I mean, as I mentioned this morning um, at, at the very beginning of proceedings, that if something had come to light um, on a well-established policy that meant that that policy needed to be changed, then consideration would have been given to changing it. Yes. 
just want to deal with a couple of points in relation to document destruction that I've been asked to ask you about. Okay. Um, first of all, in relation to Lord Owen's uh, papers, <coughs> um, we looked at the briefing note that Charles Lister did for you when you took on yeah. the role, um, and there's nothing in there that refers to Lord Owen's papers or the question of what happened to them. Do you recall discussing with uh, Charles Lister anything about I, that? I don't recall. And then if we can turn to uh, WITN 5292003, please. We can see uh, that this is a, a, an email from Robert Finch uh, to you and to Vicky King uh, discussing a meeting that had been held the day before briefing the um, uh, Permanent Secretary uh, in relation to outstanding issues on blood. And towards the end of the page, we see Lord Owen, not a priority. Was that, uh, firstly, do you recall that being discussed at the meeting? No, I don't recall it, no. I mean, it was, we discussed, as you can see, so many things. So, no, I don't. And do you recall whether that was your view as well at the time, that the question of Lord Owen's papers was not a priority? It was, it was not a priority in the context of everything else that's on these two pages. In terms of the chronology, I know that it predates your starting in the, the job, but the initial meeting with Lord Owen had been on the 1st of July 2002. Uh, he chased for a response fairly regularly, including on the 7th of October 2003. And then if we could put up WITN 5292013, please, Paul. We see the response dated the 17th of March 2004. And if we turn the page, uh, we see uh, the uh, paragraph at the top. I'm aware that an informal review of internal papers was commissioned by Yvette Cooper in 2002. I've been advised that the review is being undertaken by the Department of Health to clarify the facts surrounding the drive for UK self-sufficiency in blood products in the 1970s and 1980s. The review is based on papers available from the time. The review does not address why papers from your private office at the time may have been destroyed. Um, can you help us at all as to why the review didn't address why papers had been destroyed? No, I can't help. Sorry. When you were told that Lord <coughs> Owen's papers had been shredded by Sol, were you told about any other document destruction? such as uh, the GEB files? No, GEB files means nothing to me. So the general blood files? Oh, right, sorry, sorry. No, I, w I wasn't told. And were you told about the destruction of papers, uh, Dr Meta's private papers, uh, by, uh, apparently by Ms Sampaio? I wasn't told about anything about that at all. I have two short matters I need to ask you about now. Um, they are uh, entirely different topics. Okay. First of all, recombinant. Uh, your statement describes in some detail your role um, in relation to the recombinant rollout. So I only have a few questions that I've been asked by core participants to ask okay. you about. Um, is it right that your role was largely to implement the rollout of recombinant that had already been agreed to take place before you took up your post? That's right. I, I took on the role as chair of the recombinant working group, uh, whose role was to drive forward the rollout, yes. Uh, in your statement, uh, it's paragraph 3.28, if anyone needs to look it up, uh, you note that there were difficulties with some PCTs, primary care trusts, uh, not proactively approaching haemophilia centres and haemophilia centres being constrained by existing financial arrangements. Can you help us with what the issue was in relation uh, to that? I'm afraid I can't, sorry. And do you recall whether that difficulty was something that had been unexpected? Um, I got the impression that it was unexpected, yes. Um, well, when I took over the um, responsibility, I thought that things were uh, fairly well, fairly well um, resolved any issues. And it would have been just a question of um, driving things forward to a, a good conclusion. 
Uh, you also uh, describe in your statement that the programme uh, of uh, recombinant rollout was subject to a budget cut in yes. July 2008, and you've described the budget cut as arbitrary. Uh, from your statement, it reduced the budget from £21.3 million to £17.7 million. Yep. Uh, do you have any awareness of why the budget was cut so significantly at that time? I think it was just an arbitrary cut across the whole of Department of Health and Whitehall. And just for completeness, you were able to lobby the head of finance, uh, lobby is perhaps the wrong word, um, encourage the head of finance uh, and get the budget restored? I think lobby and, and encourage were uh, two good words, yes. And we managed to get it reinstated with conditions, but we managed to get the money reinstated. And then finally, VCJD. Uh, again, you've addressed this in detail in your statement, so just a couple of points uh, okay. that I've been asked to ask. Uh, you were an observer at the MSBT meetings. Yes. And so you attended the meeting on the 22nd of October 2003, uh, where the MSBT decided that the theoretical transmission risk of VCJD had to be weighed against the detrimental effect on the blood supply if you were to defer or exclude transfused donors. Is that right, that you were at that meeting? I was at that meeting um, on the basis of, I was shown the minutes of that meeting, which showed me there, yes. Uh, and at the October meeting, the inquiries already heard uh, that at that time they <coughs> felt the balance tipped against deferral or, or exclusion. Yeah. You were then also in attendance at the extraordinary meeting in January 2004, at which the MSBT advised that previously transfused donors should be excluded uh, because by then there had been a case of transmission, uh, a suspected transmission of BCJD by blood. Yeah. I've been asked to ask you what role the Department of Health had in ensuring that the advice of the MSBT was implemented once that decision had been taken that donors, previously transfused donors, should be excluded. Um. MSBT was an advisory committee to the Department of Health, so they, invite, they advise the Department of Health. So the, role, the blood team um, provided the secretariat to MSBT, so I attended meetings as an observer, clearly, but also as part of the secretariat. Uh, and it was our role to um, um, transmit the wrong word, sorry. My role to um, forward the recommendations and comments of um, um, MSBT to the relevant parts of the department, namely Chief Medical Officer and um, other interested parties. So you know, we, we acted as, as the Secretariat and we also provided support to um, Lindsay Davis, who was the, uh, the chair of the committee. And so in terms of your own personal role, would it be fair that it was a, a conduit role of passing information on it, to those? It, it, was a, it was a conduit role, and if um, the committee asked me any questions with regards to policy matters that I was able to answer, then I would. But I, I didn't take a proactive role in, in their deliberations because I just wasn't competent enough. I mean, these were eminent um, experts within their field. Um, and in terms of implementing that advice, was that something that was under your remit or did it go elsewhere? It was, um, if it was, normally it would be under my remit to implement any decisions because one of the other roles I had was as accounting officer for the National Blood Service. So if MSBT <coughs> made any recommendations that, um, uh, put conditions or whatever on the way um, the National Blood Service um, conducted its business, then I would, part of my role would be to ensure that the Blood Service took on those um, recommendations from MSBT as well. So those are the questions I have for Mr. Kotovsky. I wonder if we might take a break so I can receive any further questions uh, from uh, the lawyers for call participants. Yes, well, sh shall, we, shall we say, uh, how long do you want, half an hour? Half an hour, sir, just to be Very safe. Well. Um, what, uh, what happens now is that those uh, who, who are represented as core participants by, by lawyers, their lawyers have a right to ask uh, counsel to put various questions to you, which arise out of the, the evidence that you've okay. given. 
um, or, or questions that they, they think should be asked. Uh, and we must give an opportunity for that to happen. Okay. So that, that will happen. I can't promise it'll be uh, necessarily exactly uh, half an hour from now, but um, let's say not before 20 past three, that allows you plenty of time to have a cup of tea or whatever, um, and soon after that as we can, uh, and uh, council will then put the, the, the additional questions to you. Okay, thank you very much.